Thank you so much, uh, Manuel, for the kind uh, presentation and also Juan Davila and all the other organizers of the seminar for the invitation. Um, so um, today I'm going to talk about uh, some recent results, um, mainly what I have been done during the past uh, year or so and uh, which is a beautiful area that uh, I plan to continue for, for some time since, since it's, uh, the, the, the results and the, and the problems are, are very nice uh, and interesting. So uh, today I'm going to talk about long time asymptotics of large, large data uh, for KP models, okay? So um, if you have any question, please interrupt me and uh, I will try to answer them as much as I, I can. So um, without further ado, so in this talk, uh, the idea is to is is uh, very general in some sense. I will try to uh, try to say something about uh, the long time behavior of uh, solutions to KP models. Um, uh, essentially assuming the less we can assume about the data and uh, assuming that the data is large, uh, um, probably not far from anything that we know. And uh, this is a joint project with people here in Chile, Argeni Mendez, Felipe Poblete and Juan Carlos Pozo. So if you, can, uh, if you want to see the references written here, this is still a, a, a preprint, okay? So let me present you uh, the KP models. Uh, these are a equation posed uh, in R2, so in the plane. Uh, and and it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an evolution equation for a function u representing a certain uh, a, a graph, right? A function depending on, on time and x and y and representing the height of a fluid in some sense, okay? Time here is can be either positive or negative uh, for simplicity because assuming something different from R2 uh, makes the equation very, very difficult. And uh, we assume only uh, X and Y in R2. And the function U is real valued and satisfied uh, its time derivative plus its third derivative in X plus uh, nonlinearity dx U square. Right. Usually, these three terms be, uh, makes make a KDB, the famous KDB model, in one dimension. But there is an additional term coming from the um, the fact that we are working in R two, and it's a non-local term uh, having a a, 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 a a derivative of of a negative type in some sense, and two derivatives in Y. Okay, so and kappa for simplicity is either minus one or one. And this model uh, is, as I say before, uh, is a generalization of KDB to two dimensions. And the, 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 the operator dx minus one is formally, I mean, very, very generally defined as, a, as the integral of a function. Okay, but if you want to do things rigorously, uh, probably you have to go to Fourier side and interpret this operator dx minus one as, a, as its symbol in Fourier, right? Like a one over a i times c in Fourier, okay? So the KP equation were first introduced by, by, by Kadon Set and Petiashvili in the late 1970s. And they model long and weakly nonlinear wave propagating essentially uh, in the x direction. So you preserve the, the, the x direction as the main dire direction for waves. But there is a small dependence in, in the y variable. Okay. And the dependence in the y variable is written here. Uh, a small dependence is, uh, is, is very naive in some sense because there is a strong dependence in the y variable in the solutions. And, uh, and, and, it's very difficult in some sense, uh, this dependence, okay? But there is a rigorous derivation 
uh, of this model coming from the from Business model for shallow water waves, uh, the ABCD model, um, and this this derivation was obtained by Land and Lonsold uh, some years ago. Okay, so actually this model is rigorously uh, obtained from essentially water waves with, with uh, um, free surface. And uh, on the other side, as I said before, is a generalization of KDB. So it has important uh, uh, a framework that is important in some sense. So uh, for us, K kappa equals minus one is KP1. So uh, you have to assume that here you have minus one to, to have KP1, which is the case of a strong surface tension or, or if you maybe, maybe it's like a, the focus, the, the focusing case and kappa equals one is kp2 which is uh, the, the focusing case or weak surface tension okay so why are kp equations or models important because they uh, many people say that they model important phenomena in in the ocean like uh, the, the picture that i took here from it's essentially the wikipedia i think um this way is present uh, this is france probably um and uh, and it seems that uh, these waves are uh, well they they physically appear in nature and uh, they are also present in kp2 right this is a line soliton in kp2 is an exact solution of the model which is essentially a solution of of kdb uh, extended to the two dimensional uh, plane but in addition to having the, the, the KDB solution extended to the 2D case, uh, it can also be uh, oblique, uh, oblique in, in, the, in the Y variable. So it is essentially a 2D, a 2D object, okay? Like this one. And in the case of KP1, uh, you also have KP, you have lamps like, and these are like uh, ground states, but they, they, they are not really positive. They, they have uh, here positive sign and here negative sign. So they are much more complex than usual uh, uh, bump solutions like, uh, and uh, the mathematics of this kind of solution is still not well understood. Line soliton can sit either in KP1 or KP2. Uh, the behavior is very different in, in each case, but K, uh, lamps are only present, I think, in KP1. As I told you before, the situation is, is really complicated in, in general, in generality. This is a, an exact solution of KP2, the two line soliton. Uh, it represents the interaction of two uh, line solitons uh, for all time. So this is an, an exact solution of the equation. And this is a sort of degenerate solution uh, of KP2. Uh, it's essentially when these two uh, ends, they collide each other and they form this uh, degenerate Y-shaped solution also present in KP2. And uh, if you assume that, uh, if, you, if you consider this uh, solution like a, a sort of uh, uh, ends, right? Uh, here, the situation is even more complicated. This is our three soliton solutions, right? Uh, and they can be, I mean, really, really complicated in, in, in the general situation, okay? And uh, here, what you can see is KP1 lamps attached each other, like if they were um, periodic in a space. So this is the, this direction is essentially this one, right? And uh, these are lamp solution and they are, it's an exact solution. It's completely uh, periodic in a space. Um, and um, I mean, they survive for all time. It's a particular feature of KP1. Um, in, in some sense, the interaction of lamps can be, um, it's not repulsive at all. I mean, they can stage each other uh, and they, they survive. Okay, so the situation is, uh, is still more complicated than in usual dispersive models. 
So this is uh, a glimpse of uh, the zoology of solution in KP models, okay? But mathematically, uh, from the uh, from this point of view, uh, understanding KP model, I think that is uh, not it is still far from from complete. Uh, it turns out that KP one and KP two differ a lot, um, uh, even if the, there is only one sign uh, of difference uh, between them, and. Uh, it turns out that KP2 from the mathematical point of view is like a better uh, understood than KP1. Um, it turns out that uh, the world concept for KP2 is well known since uh, the work of Burgen in 1993. He proved that KP2 is globally well posed if you assume the very rough data just in L2. Um, so the, the solution is globally well posed. Uh, and there are improvement of the of the results by Burgen, by Takaota Takaota Spetkov, Isasa Mejia, and Hadak Herkog. But essentially, um, they they are like a global results for small data in some sense, uh, for 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 data uh, below L two. Uh, it turns out that uh, the KP models, they have a mass, a conserved mass, which is written here, it's just the L2 norm. It's a quantity that is formally conserved. So having a local well process in L2 for KP2 implies a global well process, okay? Uh, but in KP1, uh, solving the Kochi problem uh, at the L2 level is still not known. And the situation in KP1, as I said before, is, is more complicated. Uh, it turns out that you cannot solve for KP1 by uh, essentially a fixed point argument uh, in a suitable sobel space. And uh, it, there are plenty of results since the past 10 years um, on this model. Uh, I would like to mention the result by Molineso and Spetko, who were probably the first that proved global world postness for KP1 in a very particular uh, space, a very small space in some sense. This situation was improved by Koenig in 2004. Um, I think that probably the best result up to this time is a result by UNESCO, Kenny and Tataro, uh, who proved that the equation is globally well posed in the energy space. And the energy space here is uh, written here, is essentially functions that are in, L in R2, uh, and you don't have the gradient in L2. This is something strange, but it's part of the problem. You, you only have control on the X derivative of U and the Y derivative of U is free for, is free. You don't have a real control. And the next quantity that you have control is this uh, non-local term, dx minus one dy U in L2 that appears naturally in the equation because of the energy. The energy is just uh, the dxu in L2. And then for kp1, which is minus one, is a good sign. Then this quantity is positive. And then this quantity is controlled by the energy. Okay. It, so it appears naturally because of the energy of the problem. And then because you have a quadratic nonlinearity, then in the energy you have a cubic nonlinearity. Okay. And uh, this quantity is conserved and naturally defines an energy space, which is this one, okay? And uh, it turns out that if you have these three quantities con controlled, they are finite, then uh, up to the norm L6 of U is controlled. So this is in some sense subcritical. Um, so this is not a problem, okay? The problem is usually is this quantity. And uh, there is also a quantity that is important if you want to do dynamics, which is the momentum. Uh, it's a function u multiplied by this one. This is also conserved. So it's well defined in the energy space and measure, uh, essentially measures uh, a sort of Galilean transform that the equation has. Okay, so I told you about lamp solutions. Lamp solutions are essentially uh, ground states, but it is not yet proved. So, uh, Forgot, forget this, that, that phrase. Uh, 
but they are like soliton solutions, but they have they have algebraic decay. So it's, it has a particular scaling given by this quantity C, the square root of C and C in the Y variable, you can see that they scale different in the X and Y variable and they move only in the X direction. That's the reason I told you before that the X direction is the, is the most important direction in some sense and the Y direction is only perturbative. And the lamp solution is the field profile in the fixed profile QX on Y given here is the two derivative of the logarithm function. And uh, you can see that the uh, y variable uh, here is positive and the x variable is negative. That's the reason why uh, Q has no particular sign. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. And it sat formally satisfies the, the following uh, non-local PD, which is written here. So you can see that you don't have the Laplacian here, you only two derivatives in X, and then you have this non-local term here. Uh, proving that this Q is the only solution in a suitable sense to this non-local PDE is still unknown, okay? Um, and you don't know if, um, on the other side, you have ground states. They were uh, considered by the Bois and So. Actually, Philippe Gravella uh, proved that ground state, they must satisfy this rate of decay, which is essentially one over R squared. So they decay like one over R squared in, a, in, in, a, in R2. They are not in L1, but they are in, a, in L2, okay? But we don't know, we still don't know if uh, ground states are essentially Q up to translations, okay? That's unknown. But Liu and Wei, some years ago, using back loan transformation techniques, using the fact that the equation is integrable, Prove the orbital stability of this uh, uh, lamp Q in the energy space. Okay, so that's a hint that Q is probably uh, the unique up to translation ground state of the of the problem. So um, I, as I told you before, um, um, KP models they have a uh, special solutions. Uh, you have line solitons, you have lamps, and uh, now what you would like to say is uh, something about the long time behavior of solutions. And in particular, assuming that you don't have a particular control on the, on the initial data. Uh, something interesting about KP models is that, as I told you before, they are integrable, but the inverse scattering transform for this model uh, uh, as far as I know, is not 100% understood. Um, essentially, because the model is is uh, has some complications, particularly in KP1. Uh, I recommend you to to read these two references here. We can Hauser. Uh, it's a paper from 1987 on KP2 and Su uh, from 1990 in the KP1 case. Uh, where they prove rigorous uh, inverse scattering transform results, uh, assuming that they have a small data. Very recently, I know that someone, I don't, unfortunately, I don't remember the name, uh, improved this result uh, in the case of uh, KP2, probably. Okay. But the inverse scattering method is still not 100% rigorously defined uh, for KP models. So let me talk to you about the result we proved with the, the people here in Chile. Uh, and first I have to present you the region where we are going to work, the region in the plane. This region depends on time and you have to assume that the times is very large. So uh, this sub region of R2 will be essentially a, a sort of a rectangle that is growing in time. The window in X is growing at a power T to the power B the region in Y is also growing uh, with a different power depending on B and, and a parameter R. The parameter R cannot be uh, anything. It can go from one, five over three up to three. And the numbers, they have a meaning in some sense. And B is also uh, any number above zero and below two over three plus R, okay? Once again, uh, these numbers are, they have a meaning 
Um, you can also have shift in the in the x variable and shift in the y variable, but they are more complicated to explain. But the most important thing to to say about them is that uh, the closer you go to b, uh, the smaller is b in some sense. And so the closer you go to one, then the the b has to be small. Okay. If you want to reach the the t to the power one, then uh, b here uh, need to be decreased. Additionally, there is a second region called omega two, which is essentially a very far region of cylinders. Uh, in the x variable, they they p is any number be above one, and in the x variable, you have t to some power greater than one times a logarithm. Okay, the logarithm is just here to ensure that when p is one, then you go above t, right? And the same situation in the y variable, okay? So here's the picture. Um, there are several regions, but uh, I just mentioned omega one, which is this one here, and omega two. Omega two is the union of cylinders, okay? And uh, the, here is the line X similar to T. This is a line where you can find lamps and, and line solitons. So this region is essentially the region where you have uh, solitons and lamps, uh, line solitons and lamps. And this region here, Y similar to T is also very important because uh, you can have uh, a, solutions, particular solution moving along this region, okay? So for the purpose of, uh, of the first theorem, uh, I, I just consider this region, which is far from this one, and this region, which is far from this one. So the first result is the following. Assume that you have a solution of uh, 2KP, um, and uh, we have to consider a different cases, KP1, uh, KP2, we can assume that the data is in L2, KP2, KP1, uh, we assume that the data is in the energy space. In both cases, we have a global solution, okay? And then I can say that in the region omega one, uh, the limit of the solution, uh, take it in, the, in terms of the L2 norm, is converging to zero. So I can say you that uh, either in KP1 and KP2, in this region omega one, at least for a sequence of times, the solution is converging to zero in L2, okay? And uh, in the region omega two, uh, you can say more. You can say that the limit is converging to zero, okay? And so, the sorry, the situation here is is better than the situation inside, okay? And of course, this result uh, is not valid in the in the region X similar to T because uh, you have solitons, uh, line solitons, you have um, lamps, okay? So they don't decay to zero, okay? So you cannot have this result in, 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 the, in, the, in the other regions. And additionally, what is important is that the results are independent of KP of the of the model, of either KP1 or KP2. Uh, however, if you consider KP2, you can say uh, something better. Uh, actually, there is a result by Kenny and Martel uh, who showed that if you take any beta positive and the initial data is a small in L1 inter L2, so you consider small data, then uh, you can say that uh, the whole uh, half plane moving at, at a speed beta uh, is converging to zero. So imagine that you have this half plane here from here to infinity. So this whole region is converging to zero in KP2 if the, if the, if the data is small, okay? Uh, well, this is a technical remark. I'm not going to tell, talk uh, too much about this, um, but essentially you can say more if you assume more, right? The, but uh, this is a paper with Gustavo Ponce where we, we prove something better here. We prove the whole limit, but you have to assume 
uh, more conditions on the on the solutions. Uh, there is a way to explain that our results are sharp, but I will mention this later. Uh, and what is important is that if you have a local wealth constant theory or a global wealth constant theory for 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 perturbations of KP of KP one and KP two, then the result is still holds. Okay. Um, and that's a, a sort of uh, stability of the result with respect to perturbation of the nonlinearity. Okay, let me try to explain you here uh, why uh, we think that these results are sharp in some sense. Uh, uh, when I say the region omega one, uh, it seemed that it was a fixed rectangle, but it can take many it can take many options. It can be a rectangle where r is similar to three, which is a rectangle this way, and a and a rectangle where r is five over three, where uh, uh, the region is this uh, is of this form, and uh, you can write down everything in terms of variable x tilde and y tilde, which is which are essentially um, self-similar variables for the problem, and they were introduced by Jean Closso uh, many years ago, and they uh, they are good to understand what's happening with the with the problem. So. Written everything in terms of the, the variable x tilde and y tilde, you can uh, write down two rectangles, the limit rectangles in some sense. And uh, the limit rectangle, uh, uh, and this point here moves along this uh, hyperbola, x tilde to the power three, y tilde similar to t to power one over three. And uh, there is a parabola here uh, that appears in the work by uh, Hayashi, Namkin, and so, uh, where they prove that if you have a small solutions, then uh, the decay along this parabola is the worst possible. Okay, this is the worst possible uh, region where you uh, you have a decay. Okay, that's a particular result by Hayashi, Namkin, and so. And it turns out that this parabola coincides with the rectangle. Essentially, it's the same, uh, the limit. I mean, we cannot have a bigger rectangle uh, here because we, we overcome the parabola in some sense, okay? So uh, this is a reason where, uh, a sort of naive reason uh, why we believe that our results are sharp because uh, the small data case uh, coincides uh, with, uh, with the best possible uh, rectangle we can take. So, um, uh, well, um, uh, what I want to explain here, <laughs> there are too many pictures and each picture is, uh, each picture is complicated in some sense to explain, but, um, uh, according to uh, to Hayashi, Namkin, and so, there are two parables, and, and these parabolas are uh, highly dependent on KP1 and KP2. In KP2, you have a parabola of this form, and in KP1, you have a parabola of this form. On these parabolas, uh, uh, as I said before, you expect the worst possible decay, okay, in some sense in some sense to be precise. And uh, what we believe is that uh, in KP2, you have a better region here. And in KP1, uh, you have a, a, a better region, okay? This is a mistake here, okay? So the uh, both, both situations are in some sense uh, different depending on KP1 and KP2. And in particular, this is KP1, uh, you can see that you have, if you have lamp solutions, and then you, you, this is a, a two lamp solution, and here you have a one lamp solution, and then this one lamp solution goes faster than this one, then you will have a collision, okay? And the collision produces uh, several lamp solutions. So these are two B lamps. In some sense, you have four lamps here. And then when you see the evolution of these lamps in time, then you precisely see the parabola uh, encompassing them, right? In this region here. 
Uh, so what you expect here is that you have better situations on the on the on the left hand side, right? This region here is expected to have better better situ better um, behavior, like uh, in the in the opposite side. Okay. So this is just uh, something that we we don't have a, a way to prove it. I mean, it's it's still far from our. Um, understanding right but numerically you can see that uh, the situation is is uh, is very very interesting so, so uh, let me uh, Claudio yes but, um, but do you have any idea of the formal law those uh, those uh, lamps follow more or less in, in eventually uh, this the one those, I, these are exact solutions. Yeah, you have a formula. Uh -huh. they, they represent the interaction of, uh, of two B lamps. This is a B lamp and this is another B lamp. Right, and right. Each B lamp is like a sort of a attached two lamps, right? Uh, you have a formula and the, this four B lamp is also another formula. Everything is explicit. So uh, the problem is that um, they are expressed as matrices and it's it's, it's very difficult to write down one. I see, but they are exact solutions. They yes. do have a formula for them. Yes, absolutely. Um, um, you can see that uh, in in this particular setting, uh, KP dif differ from other dispersive model because you can have uh, a, a touch, uh, uh, and soliton and lamp structures, I, and they, I, I, they don't. I mean, they stay glued together for 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 long time. Mm. Okay. okay. So, and you can see you oh, another thing that you can see is that uh, the the momentum is preserved in this situation because, I mean, you have momentum in the x direction and in the y direction you expect zero momentum. Uh -huh. In some sense, you have a, a parity in the y direction, and mm -hmm. here you can see that the momentum is preserved in some sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, something that goes in this direction must have a counterpart here, in some sense. Okay, and the parabola is respected, right? So, um of course, everything here is uh, is not is not one hundred percent rigorous. So. It is just uh, what I can tell you from what we know at this point. And uh, uh, what is uh, what is rigorous here is the, the following result: uh, you can you can go further in KP one because you can work in the energy space and not only in L two. So we would like to know if uh, if the if the gradient in some sense of of U uh, is also decaying to zero. Okay. And then you have to restrict the, the domains a little bit, okay? It's just a little bit. It's better, it is, it is better to see the picture than the formula, okay? Uh, this is omega one, omega one tilde is a little bit smaller, okay? And omega two tilde is uh, the smallest one, okay? It's just a little bit. It can be as arbitrary as you, as you wish. And additionally, uh, if you want to, this is something very strange of KP models. Uh, you want to do something in one space, and then you need you need to to ask uh, the solution to stay in a, in a smaller space. This is particular uh, particularly important in KP one. So you want something in E one. Uh, probably you have to work in E two. And E2 is a, is, a, is a space introduced by Carlos Kenny uh, when he proved the global one process uh, for KP1. It essentially says the same, uh, the same as uh, before, but you need more uh, regularity in some sense. You assume that your solution is in L2. You still assume that this non-local term is in L2. And then you assume two derivatives of X in L2. And then you assume uh, this non-local operator twice on you. And you may say, well, this is impossible to, to be satisfied by any, 
by any reasonable function, but the lamp solution is in a, in this space. The lamp solution is uh, has a E2 energy finite. Okay. So uh, essentially, it's a good space, and it's motivated by uh, this is important because the equation is integrable. Is motivated by another energy, uh, which is in some in some sense at this level of energy. This is a function f of u, which is conserved along the flow, at least formally. But at some people prove that it, it was conserved uh, rigorously. Okay, it was Moliné and so and Spector. They prove that this this energy is conserved. Okay, along the flow. So uh, this energy motivates uh, this uh, space, okay? And if you assume that the data is E2 for KP1, then you recover the decay along a sequence of times of uh, dx minus one dyu and dx. Both quantities are called by G to zero, uh, at least for a sequence of times, okay? We conjecture that the same result is valid if your data is in E1, but up to now, we don't know who to prove this. Uh, cheap corollary of, uh, of, the, of the previous result is that uh, if you assume data in E2, in KP1, then any LP norm uh, on a compact set of R2 of the solution uh, converges to zero, uh, at least for a sequence of times, okay? For any number between two and six, and, and six, remember that six is the best possible LP norm that you can get, uh, assuming data in the energy space. Probably you can go further here, um, but I'm not sure. And infinity, probably no, not possible. Okay, so um, there are previous results on KP models. Uh, they usually consider a, a small solution. Okay, for instance, uh, there is uh, an important result by Jean Claude So, who proved the standard L L1 L infinity estimate for the KP flow. The decay is one over T, and it's in some sense critical in, in R2. So, if you, if you want to do a scattering, probably you will have to do modify scattering. Um, there are some, the previous result that I mentioned by Hayashi and Namkin, right? That they considered a KP. Uh, using the scattering methods. Uh, I also mentioned before Hadak, Herr, and Koch, right? A scattering of a small solutions for KP2 in a critical space. So it's below the L2 regularity, and, and these are the small solutions. And I mentioned before Hayashi, Namkin, and So, they prove scattering for a small data in KP2, uh, but the power of the nonlinearity has to be bigger than three. They, they, they improve the result uh, after this point, uh, but uh, the data has to be in a very particular scale, uh, space, uh, A7, and, and phi derivatives, and with, with this is a weight, a weight of order four. And there is also a result, there are also results by Harrow, Harrow Griffith, Ifrim, and Tataru. They improve this result by Hayashi and Nankin. Uh, considering spaces that are Galilean invariant, something that I didn't mention is that the equation is Galilean invariant. So there is a Galilean transform that makes, for instance, lamps, if they move in the x direction, using the Galilean transform, you can make them moving in the y direction also. There are impressive uh, numeral, numerical results by Klein and So. I think that they are very good ones. And they, they show the long time behavior of lamps and some instability properties. And the Isasa, Linaria, and Ponce also consider the propagation of regularity in KP2. And in KP1, I think that is uh, unknown, these properties. Okay, so uh, if I have some minutes, maybe, maybe five or so, or so minutes, I will try to explain you um, the situation of, uh, um, how do we prove the results, okay? Okay, the idea is to use um, a chain of uh, video identities. Um, they can be explained uh, quickly, but uh, the technique, the details are uh, maybe, um, I will skip them, okay? I will just explain the, the idea of the proof. 
So uh, you have to start out with the standard Cato smoothing estimate that in KP1 and KP2, they fail. Okay, they, they don't give a good, uh, a good uh, results. Uh, unless you you continue doing some some additional estimates, okay. So you have to assume that you have some scalings in the in this paper. We need uh, six scalings. They, they they are ordered, and we have we need some attenuation functions that that are called eta, eta one, eta two, and eta three, and they they move in a different uh, direction the each time the attenuation function is uh, smaller okay and you consider the attenuation function the l2 norm then you have a weight in a particular scaling and another weight in the y variable in a particular scaling okay and uh, if you have faith uh, you compute the derivative of this quantity and what you can find is that the the x derivative of u uh, with a particular weight in the x variable and in the y variable. And if you choose eta one properly, you can have at, uh, here t log t. It's bounded by the derivative of k, which is essentially bounded in L2, uh, plus the uh, bad term, the x minus one dy u, and then a uh, cubic power of u, and then something that is integrable, okay? Um, essentially, uh, if you consider um, better models like uh, uh, Sakharov Kunneso, what you have here is the gradient of u. You don't have nothing here, and you have the cubic power here. But in KP, you have this very bad term and uh, the cubic power. So essentially, you will have control on the derivative of u. Uh, unless you have control on this guy and this guy. And that's what you have to do in the next uh, video estimates. So we, you will use the momentum uh, with a particular weight in the X variable and another particular weight in the Y variable and another particular attenuation function. And then uh, once again, you, you have faith and uh, compute the derivative of this quantity in time, um, fortunately, it gives you a control on this quantity uh, in, with some particular weights, right? Uh, in terms of uh, the cubic power, once again, and the quadratic power. And here you have to play a, a game on the parameters in such a way that uh, uh, the cubic power has a power here, t log t, and the quadratic power has a power t only okay so essentially you you need control on the cubic power and on the quadratic power and then you will have control on this quantity and from the previous estimate you will have control on this and this and then you will have control on this quantity so the final estimate is to consider a final a virial term which is just a function u with some particular weights and the weights are just technical. Essentially, you have here x, then you have something that is needed to, to make everything uh, correct, and then some weight in the y variable. Once again, you compute the time derivative, and uh, here you use especially the equation to have control on the quadratic part of u uh, with a particular weight uh, in terms of quantities that are integrable in time. So if you, if, you, if you consider the three inequalities at the same time, then you will have control on u square. Having control on u square uh, and doing some particular estimates, you will have control on u cube at the same time. So you will have control on u square and u three, and then you will have control on this quantity. Um, and having control on this quantity and this one, you will have control on this one. So that is chain of inequalities that you need. Uh, so um, that's one part of the problem because uh, essentially you have to reduce the, um, the, the scalings here 
uh, to the particular regions that we obtain in the main theorem. But that's only something technical. It's just uh, a sort of a particular cut that you need to do uh, in such a way that you recover the region of the main theorems. Okay. But the idea is, is just that one. I mean, you have control on these quantities, then you can integrate in time. And the fact that you integrate in time gives you some decay, right? And the decay is along that sequence of times. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much.